All right, great to be in England. Are you happy to be here? Uh, my name is Pastor David Asherick. I am uh, from the United States of America, but I presently pastor in... I just actually gave this quiz to somebody today. I pastor in the hottest, flattest, driest, most inhospitable continent not named Australia. Or excuse me, not named Antarctica. I just gave it away. It's Australia. <laughs> So uh, I, I hail now from Australia. I've been there for three and a half years, and it's a real privilege to have been invited. So a big thank you to the leadership team here of the Campus Ministries Compass event. It's my understanding this is an inaugural event, or you've done this many times? Okay, so this is, a, this is an inaugural event. Okay, now I was told... Um, and I'm going to gauge the accuracy of what I've been told here, that sort of most people would be somewhere between about 18 and 25. Okay, so I want you to raise your hand if you are between 18 and 25. Oh, so I have been correctly informed. Great. Is there anybody who's younger than 18? Okay, there's one of you. Do you feel sort of awkward, sort of alone? Okay, and who's older than 25? Who are the oldies that are here? Okay, there's a few. There's a few. All right, well, it's great to be here, and I'm looking forward to being with you this evening. It's going to make my job a lot easier if you have your Bibles with you. Raise your hand if you have your Bible with you. Oh, oh, great. This is wonderful. Your phone counts. Your phone counts. We'll take a modern Bible, no problem. So... I want to talk to you tonight about something that is super important to me, super important in Scripture, and uh, I was sort of wrestling with exactly what to share. The problem is not that I have too little to say, as is always the case when I go to preach somewhere, I have too much that I want to say. And so what I'm going to try and do is say only the right amount, and my temptation is to talk to you about 10 things but I'm going to try to talk to you about two things, one tonight and one tomorrow night. Now, that can easily expand. It could turn into six, seven, eight, nine. It could turn into many things, but we're going to try to stick to two. And tonight, I want to make one major point. And uh, we're going to spend our time both tonight and tomorrow night in the book of Acts. What book, everyone? Yeah. Book of Acts. And we're going to go, let's do a little test here. We're going to go to the chapter in which we find the conversion of a guy named Saul of Tarsus. You tell me, what chapter are we going to go to? Does anybody know? Anybody that's not a pastor know? <laughs> Acts chapter 9. Join me in Acts chapter 9, if you would. Acts chapter 9. Now, let's sort of orient ourselves here a little bit. We'll start with prayer, and then we're going to orient ourselves to the book of Acts, and then we're going to hone in on Acts chapter 9. We're going to survey the text. And then we're going to make application. We're going to make what, everyone? Application. But before we're going to ask the question, what does it mean? We're going to ask the question, what did it mean? Right? That's the hermeneutical order. We're going to start with what it did, and we're going to move to what it does. What did it mean by the original author to the original audience in the original context? And then we're going to ask the sometimes more problematic question, what does it mean for me here today in my context, my situation, my life? So we're going to start with prayer, and then we're going to move to Acts chapter what, everyone? Acts chapter 9. Father in heaven, be with us. You have already been with us in worship. You have been with us in prayer. You have been with us in fellowship, socializing, connecting, the icebreaker. And we have every reason to believe that you're going to be with us now. And so, Father, as we open the text, may you open us. As we open the Word, may you open our hearts. And I pray, Father, that tonight you will give me just the right words, just the right illustrations, just the right elocution, so that we might extract from the text something that by the power of the Spirit will be uh, wonderfully and profoundly applicable to our lives. Uh, Father, we're students, whether we're workers, whether we uh, are parents, or whatever our social context is, give us wisdom tonight to make application by the Spirit of the text, the ancient text, Make it tonight, Father, a very modern text as we go to Luke's book of Acts is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Let everyone say, amen. All right, let's just spend about three or four minutes, maybe more, by way of orienting ourselves to the book of Acts. 
The book of Acts was written, as I mentioned in my prayer, by who? Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. He wrote two books, one that bears his name, the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and he also wrote the book of Acts. In both cases, it appears that he wrote the book to a man named Theophilus. What's his name, everyone? Theophilus. And there is scholastic debate about who Theophilus might be or whether or not Theophilus was even a person at all. The word Theophilus literally means two words, Theos and Phileo, which is friend of God. So it's possible that this is just a pseudonym or a general moniker for people that were the friends of God. I think that's unlikely. I think Theophilus was in fact a man's name, a Greek man's name. Certainly his name did mean friend of God, but we're not exactly sure who Theophilus is. There are a number of ideas and theories and postulates as to who he could have been. The one that I personally find most persuasive and frankly most intriguing is the idea that Luke is writing to Theophilus and Theophilus occupies the role of kind of like Paul's defense attorney in Rome. Paul's defense attorney, you may be aware, in the book of Acts, Paul makes a number of journeys and the last journey that he makes is to the city of Rome. And he goes to Rome so that he can, as a Roman citizen, make his appeal before Caesar. And Luke is writing down the stories, the journeys of Paul, uh, of which Luke was a part. He was on those journeys in order to initiate Theophilus into an awareness of who Paul is and probably more importantly, who Paul is not. And Theophilus seems particularly concerned with letting, uh, Luke seems particularly concerned with letting Theophilus know that Paul is no threat to Rome. In fact, in the book of Acts, again and again and again, Rome as a nation, Rome as individual soldiers, Rome comes to the rescue of Paul, right? So Rome is painted in a very positive light, a very favorable light, and so you sort of get this feel that, that Luke is developing a case that he's sending to Theophilus so that when Paul stands before Caesar in Rome, he can say, look, Paul is no threat. He's a friend of Rome. Rome comes to his rescue. He's not someone that needs to be imprisoned and certainly not someone that needs to be executed. Sadly, tragically, the, the, the effect and the hope, the hoped for outcome is not going to come to pass. Saul will give his life in a martyr's death. It will happen in Rome. His appeal is not going to go as hoped. Luke is going to be devastated. The church is going to be devastated to say nothing of Paul's own devastation. That's our context. So this is a book, it's a very important book. It's a book that's written by a specific author at a specific time into a situation. Into a what, everyone? Into a situation. And Luke writes with a, ah, I, I tell you, I, I, I have fallen in love afresh with the book of Acts. For a long time, my favorite book in the New Testament was the book of Romans, probably the last, oh, five of the last seven years. But over the last two years, the book of Acts has emerged as my current favorite book. And Luke, I had an underappreciation for the richness, the symmetry, and the depth with which he writes. And I want to share with you just one little vignette tonight, one little vignette. And here's where Luke is going to tell the story of the conversion of the man that is no doubt his personal hero. Jesus is Luke's savior. Of this there is no question, but Paul is Luke's hero. When, when Luke thinks about Paul, when he writes about Paul, he, he writes about Paul as, an unstu as a force, not just a man, as a force, as someone who has this, this insatiable, uh, 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 he cannot be fatigued, he cannot be stopped, he's a, he's a force of nature. By, by any ancient standard, he, he travels to, to the farthest parts of the habitable globe, moving throughout the greater Mediterranean world, and he does so with bravery. He does so with savory, savvy. He does so with a, with a methodology that endears him not only to the circumcised, that is the Jew, but to the uncircumcised. And so when Luke writes about Paul, he writes about Paul not just as an academic, not just as somebody who has a disinterested uh, sort of, you know, I hope he gets off with, with Caesar in Rome. No, 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 no. Luke is writing about his hero. Somebody that he has traveled with, the pronoun in the book of Acts changes from you and they and theirs to us and ours at about Acts chapter 11, 12, and 13. This gives us the sense that Luke, unlike the first chapters of Acts, sort of 1 to 10, where he's researching and observing events that he was not 
in person for. In the latter part of the book of Acts, he's there. He's on the ship. He's traveling with Paul. He's into the cities. He has seen Paul go into a city, preach the gospel, be thrown out of that city, be stoned, stoned to such a degree that it was thought that he was dead. Right? The people are looking at him and they think, he's dead. And then Paul, by some miracle of physiology, rises. He, he wasn't actually dead, but he appeared to be dead. And he rises up, and, and Paul's question is only this. Where is the city? And, uh, of course, the onlookers would have thought he was delusional. They would have thought perhaps he's going to run in the opposite direction. Uh, Paul, Paul, the city is that way. And Paul gets up, somehow wipes the blood and the dust from himself, and begins to head back to the city. Well, but, but, but Paul, what are you doing? What are you going back into the city? These people, I, I, before I thought they needed to hear about Jesus, and now it is a certainty that they need to hear about Jesus. <laughs> right, right, right. So Luke writes about Paul certainly with accuracy. It, it, it's not as though there's this legendary embellishment. I'm not suggesting that at all. But he, he writes about him in the same way that you would write about somebody that you look up to. How many people here have somebody that they would regard as a mentor? Somebody that you, a, a big role in your life, could be a parent, could be a friend, could be a professor. You look up to this person. Okay, that's Paul for Luke. And so when Luke writes about Paul, he's going to write about him in a way that is accurate, but is also personable. It's real, it's actual. And nowhere is this clearer than in Acts chapter 9. Come with me to Acts chapter 9, where we're going to be exposed to Luke's telling of his hero's conversion. You might know this story. With the raising of your hand, how many are at least broadly familiar with the story of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus? Raise your hand if that story is somewhat familiar, okay? Raise your hand if it's not at all familiar. Okay, maybe five or six of you. Let's do this. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Then Saul, this is pre-conversion. This is not Paul yet. This is not Paul the apostle. This is Saul. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Who did he go to, everyone? He went to the high priest. He has an in with the high priest. He knows the high priest. He has the cell phone number of the high priest in his phone. It's not the green bubble. It's the blue bubble. He can go to the high priest. He, get, he has a direct point of access to the high priest. This is a young man, upwardly mobile, connected, passionate, exceedingly passionate about his ancestral faith and his ancestral tradition, which is, in this case, the Jewish tradition. And so he goes to the who? Who does he go to, everyone? He goes to the high priest. Okay, what happens? Verse 2. He asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. We now know why he went to the high priest. He has a point of access, and when he gets access to the high priest, he says, hey, 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 I'm going to be journeying to Damascus. And I'm concerned about our ancestral faith. I'm concerned about our heritage. It's under attack from these people that are simply called at this point, the way. What are they called? The way. This is an unambiguous reference by the early Christians. They were not yet called Christians. That doesn't happen until Acts chapter 11. When Jesus had spoken, he had said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the early believers weren't quite sure what to call themselves. And so they apparently just called themselves the way. Paul is, Saul rather, is concerned about the way. So he goes to the high priest and he says, if I find any of these heretics, if I find any of these miscreants, if I find any of these people, I want to bring them, willingly or unwillingly, bound to Jerusalem. Okay, so the first thing we can say about Paul is he's zealous. Are we good with that? He's passionate. He's zealous. What's he zealous for? Well, he believes he's zealous for God. We together? He thinks, oh, I'm passionate about God. I'm passionate about my people. I'm passionate about my faith. I'm passionate about my culture. And so he is going to, in the name of God, and in the name of protecting his ancestral faith and his own religious identity, culture, and, and person, the person that he is and, and, and the, the identity that he possesses as a Jew, he wants to bind these people. This is already an insight. We'll pick this up tomorrow. But it's, an already, it's already an insight for us into the kind of God that Paul thinks exists. This is a God who would be perfectly pleased to have people bound 
and brought back because they're not believing the right thing. They're not teaching the right thing. That's going to become an important insight for us tomorrow night. That's not our insight tonight. Verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. This is the Damascus Road experience, right? There's precious little detail here. It's just that he's journeying, and as he's journeying, he experiences what theologians call a theophany. A theophany means an appearance of God, right? When God appears, he often appears in unusual ways, right? A burning bush, when God shows up, he doesn't show up as God. Moses had asked, God, I, I, I just want to see what you're like. And God had said, well, it doesn't work like that. I can't show you what I'm like. If I showed you the fullness of my divine nature, you would certainly perish. So we'll do it like this. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over you, and you can only see my back parts. All of these are metaphors to, to show and to, to help us to understand that the chasm that separates the creator from the created is an unbridgeable chasm. It's an infinite chasm. So anytime God shows up in one of these theophanies, it's always a condescension. And here we're not given any particular detail as to what the theophany looked like. It just says, suddenly a light shone around him. A light shines around him. God shows up into Saul's world, into Saul's situation. Verse 4, then he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. This is key. This is key. The importance of these two words in, in this orientation can hardly be overstated. I wrote out a little few notes on a piece of paper, but I don't have it in front of me. Oh, thank you. Fill out. God bless you. For Luke, this is an important marker. If a theologian were studying this passage, he or she would immediately be curious about the use of the repetition in the name, Saul, Saul, and then the question, the question of incredulity. Why are you persecuting me? What exactly are you doing? Now, we'll move to the incredulous question maybe a little bit later, but what I want to do is just, I want to settle in to this idea of Saul, Saul. This is a Lucan marker, and it means something. And what it means is fantastic, and it's what we're going to spend our time on tonight. It's all we're going to talk about tonight. We have encountered this several times. We will, in our reading of Luke, we will encounter this, this repetition of the name, this marker, on numerous occasions. We're going to come to those in just a moment. But I believe that Luke grabs this, this Saul, Saul language, and Jesus uses this Saul, Saul language. Jesus uses it. Luke grabs it. For, for purposes that we'll get to in a moment, but these come from the Old Testament, okay? The first time that we encounter, in fact, this is a bit of a trivia question. I will be absolutely thrilled if somebody can give me the right answer to this. Can somebody tell me, does anybody know, when is the first time that we experience this repetition of the name in the Old Testament? Okay, very good. Yeah, big hug, big hug. <laughs> We're not doing high fives. We're doing hugs around here. <laughs> Genesis 22. So, so God has called a man by the name of Abraham. And he has said, you're going to be a great nation. Your nation is going to be so great. Abraham, look to the stars of the sky. Do you see the stars? Yes, I see the stars. That your descendants will be more than the stars of the sky. Look to the sand of the sea. Do you see the sand? Yes, I see it. Your descendants will be more. The problem is, is that Abraham doesn't have a son, and he protests eventually. He says, God, how is this going to happen? I don't have a son. I don't have an heir. How will I have all of these descendants that you're promising? And God says, no, 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 trust me, it's going to happen. It doesn't happen quickly enough, and so you might know the story that Abraham lies with his uh, wife's handmaid, a woman by the name of Hagar, and then he has a child named Ishmael, but it wasn't a child through Sarah. Eventually, a child is born through Sarah, and the child's name is what? Who remembers? What's that child's name? Isaac, and the word Isaac means laughter, Itzhak, laughter, okay? Then God makes the strangest request. He says, I want you to take your son, your only son, your beloved son Isaac, and I want you to offer him as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. Kill your son, the promised son, the long-awaited son. Abraham at this point is nearly 100 years old, and the command is, is inscrutable. The command is absurd. Kill the promised son. And yet, in an act of obedience, and, and I wish time allowed us, and maybe it does allow us just a little window, in, in to explore, why would Abraham do such a foolish thing? 
seemingly foolish. Well, frankly, I can tell you this. I have two boys, Landon and Jabel, 16 and 14, almost 15. And if I heard a voice in my head, or even, frankly, an audible voice, if I today heard an audible voice that said to me, David, kill your son, Landon, I would not do it. I would, no way, I would not do it. Even if I thought it was the voice of God, I would not do it. He said, man, you're less obedient than Abraham. No, I've just lived later than Abraham. I live now with the awareness of what was happening with Abraham, and this is what was happening. God had told Abraham that he was going to go into the land of the Canaanites, the land of the Canaanites. We know that the seven nations that inhabited what was ancient Canaan were nations that practiced many things that were very terrible, things that were horrific, including, and God mentions this repeatedly in the books of Moses and Joshua, he says, these people kill their own children. They sacrifice their children to gods. They, 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 they burn their children to the gods, and later, later, God would say in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 19, God would say, this never even came into my mind. The idea that I would somehow be pleased. Now, frankly, there's a certain logic to it, right? There's a certain logic to it because if, if God asks for a sacrifice, say, of wheat, I bring in my best wheat. And if God asks for a sacrifice of, say, a lamb, and I bring in my best lamb, and if God asks for a sacrifice of, say, a bullock, and I bring my best bullock, you, you can sort of see the logic to it. Well, I can bring more wheat. I can bring more lambs. I can bring more bullocks. But if there's an escalation here in importance... Eventually, I might get to the place where I say, I am so passionate about God. I am so devoted to God. I so love God. I'm going to sacrifice the thing that means the most to me. I'll sacrifice my son. You can see how that's fairly linear. It's fairly logical. But God says, this idea that you would bring your son to me, he says, this idea never even came into my mind. I find it repulsive. In fact, he says it's so repulsive that he finds th these places where this child sacrifice takes place. He says, I'm an alien to those places. They are foreign to me. And yet Abraham living as he did in these primeval times, these primitive times, when God said to him, take your son, your only son Isaac, and kill him, Abraham would have gone, well, all right. Because it was in keeping with the kinds of things that the gods of the Canaanites would ask. And so Abraham, in his frustration, his, his anxiety, his confusion, he would have gone along with the request, he would have capitulated, and that's exactly what happens. Genesis chapter 22, he marches up the, he, he, he marches up the hill with his son Isaac. Isaac's saying, Dad, there's the wood, and you know we've got everything for the sacrifice, but where's the lamb? And then Abraham, without knowing it, preaches the gospel because he says, God will provide a lamb himself. Now, let me just insert a comma there that will help you to understand what he's saying. God will provide a lamb, comma, himself. When they get to the top and, and, and Abraham lays Isaac out and he takes the knife and he's just about ready to do the deed, the terrible, disgusting, repugnant deed that God hates, He's just about ready to do the unthinkable, the thing that God himself doesn't even... And he's just about ready to plunge the knife through his own beloved child. I mean, as a father, I can't even... It's just, it just, it's just jittery to even think about the idea. It's really disconcerting to even think about it. And just at the moment he's about ready to do it, God arrests his hand and says two words to him. What two words does he say? Abraham, Abraham. This is the first time that we encounter this marker, this biblical marker of the repetition of the name. Not just Abraham. In fact, what he says is, Abraham, Abraham, do not harm the child. Abraham is insufficient here. Just, just one mention of the name is insufficient. It's not just Abraham, don't hurt the child. It's Abraham, Abraham, don't harm the child. There's another passage that will come much later in the Minor Prophets. You probably know this verse. If I started it, you could probably finish it. It goes like this. He has shown thee, O man, what is good. You know this text? And what the Lord requires of thee, to do, just, to, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Do you know that verse? 
That's Micah chapter 6, verse 8. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What's fascinating about that is the verses just before that, in verses 6 and 7, Micah is saying, with what will I come before the Lord? With what will I bow down myself to the Lord? Would he be pleased with 10,000 rams? Would he be pleased with rivers of oil? With what will I present myself? And then he says, what about my firstborn? Should I give the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Should I offer my son? Should I offer my child? And God's response is, no, 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 no. He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, and it's not child sacrifice, is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So when he's just about ready to plunge the knife into his son's chest, the words come, and what are the two words? Abraham, Abraham. That is in theological speak what's called, we're going to employ here what's called the law of first usage or the rule of first usage. And what it means is something like this. When we encounter something that will become later important or even perhaps normative in Scripture, we're going to put a lot of emphasis on the first time we encounter it. What's happening here on Mount Moriah? I'll tell you what's happening. What's happening is that Abraham is in the midst of a colossal misunderstanding about the nature of reality and the nature of God. I want to say that again. Abraham is in the midst of a colossal and inestimably large misunderstanding about the nature of reality and the nature of God. Living as he does in Canaanite territory and occupying Canaanite theology occupying some portion of real estate in Abraham's mind, even though Abraham was deeply troubled by the request, he thought, well, I guess this is just the kind of things that gods want. Other gods, Moloch and other gods, have made such requests, and so I suppose that Yahweh is no different. And so he marches his son, his beloved son, his beautiful son, his tender son, his promised son. He marches him up the mountain, ties him up, puts him on the altar, and is prepared to do the deed, to do the unthinkable. And as he's just about ready to plunge the knife into the throat, or perhaps the chest of his son, the two words come. And what are the two words, everyone? They are... Abraham, Abraham, don't hurt the child. And then at just that moment, miraculously, supernaturally, serendipitously, there is a, a, a ram that is caught in the thicket. The question had been, as they were making their way up the mountain, where's the lamb? And Abraham had preached the gospel without, without even fully understanding it himself. My son, God will provide a lamb himself. And here this ram is caught in the thickets. And there's so much going on here. There's just so much going on here, but I'm going to have to pass by this. There's so much going on here. Caught in the thickets by its horns, Abraham takes the ram. This is the key. This is the point. This is the whole point. Takes the ram, offers the ram in place of Isaac, and then calls the place Jehovah Jireh. God provides. Yahweh provides. Now, let me translate all that really thick theology that's going on there. The gospel is not about you bringing an amazing sacrifice to God. The gospel is about you accepting the amazing sacrifice that God has brought to you. Which is why today, in 2017, if I heard some voice that said, take your son Landon and kill him, I would know to say no because I now know living as I do after the cross and after the great revelation that we have of who God is in Christ, I know that God would never ask such a thing. But if I lived... If I lived back here in the time of Abraham with all of this Canaanite real estate, both geographical real estate and intellectual mental real estate, and God made such a request, I might think that that's just the kind of thing that God wants me to do. I now know that that's not the kind of thing you would ask. In fact, God says that never even came into my mind. I'm repulsed by that. That's alien to me. That's disgusting by me. And when God goes to arrest the attention of Abraham and to set him on a right path, he says, Abraham, Abraham, you are right now in the midst of a major, a colossal misunderstanding about the nature of God and the nature of reality itself. You don't offer me a sacrifice. You accept the sacrifice I offer. 
We are reoriented now. The place is not called Abraham Jireh. It's called Jehovah Jireh. Moses, of course, wrote the book of Genesis. He also wrote the book of Exodus. The second time that we encounter this repetition of the name, it's Moses. Exodus 3. Moses' writing, as he does the book of Exodus, is, is short on details, but here's a really fascinating little insight. The first time we see Moses there, he's essentially, this is Exodus chapter 1 and 2, he's, a, he's a, Exodus 1 actually, he's a baby that has been uh, retained, you know, secretly against the, the uh, command of Pharaoh, placed into a little ark and slid into the bulrushes, and Miriam, the sister, waits. The, the, the Egyptian you know, queen comes over, sees it, and the, the boy is rescued. Okay? Then he's raised in the house of Pharaoh after the boy's weaned. We know the story, many of us. The next three times we see Moses, this is key. This is Moses telling his own story. This isn't David telling Moses' story. This isn't another person telling Moses' story. This is Moses telling his own story. The next three times that we see Moses, not as an infant in a little ark of bulrushes, but as an adult, in each instance... He comes off, frankly, as a bully. He comes off as using his muscles to solve problems. Okay, so the first time we see him, right, he, he sees there's an argument, and uh, it's between an Egyptian and one of his own people, a Hebrew, and he goes in, and he solves the argument by smiting the Egyptian, and the Egyptian dies. Scene one, Right? The next time that we see Moses, um, the very next day, in fact, he sees two of his own people arguing, and here he's going to come in, and he's going to be the tough guy, and he's going to sort it out. Hey, 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 what are you guys arguing about? And then one of the people that he's trying to sort out here says to him, hey, hey, what, what are you going to do to us? Are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Moses realizes that he's found out. This is scene two now, so he's used his muscle to try and create a better situation. So Moses realizes that he's found out. He knows that Pharaoh's going to have his head, and so he flees, and he comes to a well in Midian. This is the third scene. When he comes to a well in Midian, there are some women there that are trying to water their animals, but when they try to water their animals, some shepherds come in, and they're preventing the women, and Moses comes in, and he sorts the shepherds out. Hey, 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 ladies first. So, so the three vignettes, this isn't my telling of Moses' story. Moses' telling of his own story goes like this. It's a very quick telling of his own story. There's a, there's a certain humility in his story. We might say today that Moses comes off by his own description of himself as a hothead. He's got a temper, and he's apparently fairly good with his fists. I mean, you strike somebody and you kill them. You, you, you know how to handle yourself in terms of combat. And so in Moses' own story, the way that he tells his own story, he's going to solve problems, and he's going to solve problems with his own strength, with his own power. Okay, so then we come to Exodus chapter 3, and Moses has now been a shepherd in the wilderness where he's learning that uh, probably you don't know a lot about sheep, I'm guessing, sort of urban environment here. Any shepherds here tonight? <laughs> Shepherd, okay. I was guessing that might be the case. Um, well, I'm just going to give you the short version. You cannot shepherd sheep with your musculature, right? You, you can be a very strong, able-bodied man or woman, and that in and of itself is not going to help you shepherd sheep. Shepherding sheep takes patience. It takes, it, it, it's, it's, I, I think it's like basically you become insane trying to keep these creatures all together, and you're following them around, and they take guidance, and it takes nuance, and it takes sensitivity, and it takes an awareness of how to think like a sheep, act like a sheep. So it's this whole process that Moses goes through for 40 years. 40 years goes through this process where he's learning it's not going to happen with your biceps. It's a whole subtle thing. And then Moses sees this sight. He sees this sight. It's a burning bush. And he approaches the burning bush because he spent 40 years in the wilderness at this point. He spent 40 years as a shepherd, and he knows that this is an, an unnatural phenomenon. And so he approaches the burning bush, and when he approaches the burning bush, he hears... Two words. What two words does he hear? Moses, Moses. That's what he hears, Moses, Moses. Why Moses, Moses? Because like Abraham, 
Moses in the, is in the midst of a colossal misunderstanding about the nature of God and the nature of reality. Moses had been taught by his mother that in some sense, some significant sense, he might occupy the place of a deliverer, and he had assumed, quite incorrectly, that if he was going to be a deliverer, it was going to require a certain amount of power, a certain amount of strength, a certain amount of bravery, a certain amount of muscle. In fact, it's going to take patience, it's going to take tenderness, it's going to take emotional sensitivity, it's going to take organizational skills, it's going to require a whole lot more. It's going to require mental biceps, not physical biceps. And so when he sees the burning bush, God's two words to Moses are, Moses, Moses, you are right now in the midst of a colossal, major misunderstanding about the nature of reality and the nature of God. And so what Luke does... I'm persuaded of this. What Luke does is he takes this, and there are other instances, but these are the two I think that are formative. He takes the Abraham, Abraham, and he takes the Moses, Moses, and he noted, he notices that in the stories, Luke himself was not, a, was not a, a, an eyewitness to Jesus. He's done research on the things that Jesus has said, and he's, he's heard that there were several instances in which Jesus himself used this repetition of the name. I wonder if anybody in here remembers any of these. Can you think of a New Testament occurrence where Jesus uses a name, someone's name, twice? What is this one? What is that one? Okay, very good. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a great one. What's another one? Oh, Martha, Martha. Simon, Simon. You got another one for me? I'll give you a hint. This one's not a person. It's a place. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Let's start with Martha, Martha. That's Luke chapter 13. Martha, Martha. What's happening, Martha, Martha? Jesus has gone into the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Martha is a busybody. She's working. She's here, there. She's trying to get the meal ready. She's a bundle of activity, frenetic energy, trying to get things just right, and she notices that her lazy sister is sitting, sitting apparently idly at the feet of Jesus, and so she protests. She's like, hey, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. And Jesus' response is, Martha, Martha, you are right now in the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality. He says, your sister has chosen the better part. I know it looks lazy to you, but this devotional act is actually going to be more important than getting the haystacks ready or the food ready, right? Martha, Martha. Simon, Simon. Ah, Peter had said, though all men deny you, I won't. I will not. Though everyone denies you, I will not deny you. I'm not sure about these other knuckleheads, but when it comes down, when the rubber meets the road, when, when, when the chips are down, Jesus, I will not deny you. Simon, Simon. You are right now in the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality. In fact, you think you are strong, but before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. And when you are converted, then strengthen your brothers, the ones that you're ready to throw under the bus right now. Simon, Simon. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stones those that are sent to thee. How often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You think that you sit as a city on a, on a, city on a hill. You are, you are unstoppable. You are impregnable. You are protected by the great God of the universe, Yahweh himself. Nothing can happen to you. You're a city on a hill. And yet Jesus weeps over that city. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you are right now in the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality. When we find this repetition of Saul, Saul in Acts 9, it is purposeful. It is absolutely intentional. Saul has gone to the high priest to get letters so that he can arrest any who are of the, 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 the way and he can bring them bound if need be to Jerusalem. And so he, by the way, there's just a point on here. There's a point that needs to be made. 
Believing that God is on your side in the persecution or the minimization of others does not mean that God is on your side. It just means that you think God is on your side. God's not on Saul's side. God is not at all pleased, but Saul is convinced that God would be pleased. The things that we do that are equivalent to persecuting or character assassination or, or judging others, that we are absolutely convinced we are in the right. We may not be in the right. We're just convinced that we're in the right. And God's response to Saul's zeal is to say, Saul, Saul. You see, friends, we did that little biblical exploration there of Abraham, Abraham, and Moses, Moses, and Martha, Martha, and Simon, Simon, and Jerusalem, Jerusalem, to, to set a context here. Because in each of these instances, the repetition of the name has the same point. And the point here is you are right now in the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality and the nature of God. No wonder he then asks the question, who are you, Lord? He does not recognize the voice. The voice is not one that he knows. And so the question is the inevitable question. Who are you, Lord? And he is totally unprepared for the next three words. I am Jesus. The very one that he had thought was the arch heretic whose followers were the greatest threat to his ancestral faith he now realizes that he has found himself on the wrong side of history. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. It's hard for you to resist. There is an honesty, Jesus is saying here inside of you, but you're kicking against that honesty. Verse 6, verse six says, So he trembling and astonished. Not just trembling, and not just astonished, but trembling and astonished. He says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord had said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. We'll pick this up tomorrow night. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing nothing, or excuse me, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground when his eyes were open and he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. We're going to resume all of that from verse 6 to 9 tomorrow. I want to hone in on 4 and 5, and I want to bring you to another passage. If you've got your Bible, come with me to Luke chapter 6. Keep your finger here. We're going to come right back to Acts 9. Come to Luke 6. If you've got your Bible, that'd be great. Luke 6. Luke 6. Luke 6 is a passage of Scripture that you've probably heard before, and if you've not heard it before, you've probably heard it quoted before, if you've not read it yourself. We more often quote it in the Matthew chapter 7 version, but it's also found in Luke 6, and we pick it up in verse 46, Luke 6, 46. Now, I want you to take everything that we've learned up to this point and just bear it, bring it to bear on this text. Abraham, Abraham. Moses, Moses, Martha, Martha, Simon, Simon, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Saul, Saul. In each case, in the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality. Now watch this. Switch this up. Verse 46, Luke 6, 46. But why do you call me... What are the next two words? Lord, Lord. Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? There's the repetition of the name. In the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality and God. And do not do the things that I say. What's your name? What's your name? Nom is your name? Nice to meet you, Nom. God might need to say Nom tonight. 
or he might need to say, Nom, nom. Josephine. God might need to say, Josephine, tonight. But he might need to say, Josephine, Josephine. When we approach God, if we are approaching God in this posture of Lord, Lord, clearly the point that Jesus is making and that Luke is emphasizing here is that these are people that do not know who they think they know or what they think they know. A little bit later in the very same gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 12, or excuse me, Luke chapter 13, Luke 13, I'll just read this for you, Luke 13, 25 if you've got it. Luke 13. <clears throat> Jesus is telling a story. He's telling a parable. Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house, I'm in verse 25, has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you or where you are from. Lord, Lord. Come back with me to Acts 9. Our final text of the evening, our final point. Acts 9. I think the point is clear. I think it's really clear. Something about the Lucan use, or at least the Lucan, the Lucan literary usage of this repetition, mirrors Moses' use of the repetition. Jesus employed this marker repeatedly, and in every case, without exception, it meant the same thing. Whoever uses, oh, by the way, we didn't mention, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus in that moment, we, when he felt totally abandoned, when he felt that it was the end of his, of his existence, when he, in the words of Ellen White, could not see through the portals of the tomb, he cries out to God, Eli, Eli, my God, my God. At that moment, Jesus, emotionally, is in the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality. God has not abandoned Jesus. Sin has cut him off. These are very different things. So in each case, when we encounter this repetition of the name, we encounter a situation where someone does not understand what they think they understand. Abraham thought that God wanted him to have, sacrifice his son. God's like, that's not at all what I want. You're in the midst of a major misunderstanding. Moses thought that God wanted him to sort out his problems with his own strength, his own ingenuity, and his own cleverness, and that's not at all what God wanted. God wanted submission, not cleverness, not strength, not biceps, not fortitude. He said, Moses, Moses. Simon was just sure that the thing that Jesus would want would be a show of, of strong loyalty and affirmation. Though everybody denies you, I certainly will not. Simon, Simon. Martha was sure that Jesus would affirm her in her frustration with her sister Mary and her devotional laziness. Martha, Martha. Jerusalem was absolutely sure that they were the chosen people of God, the, the, the city on a hill, the, the people that could not be overcome. Jesus looks into the future in just a few short years, and he sees the destruction of Jerusalem, and with tears running down his cheeks, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, what you think is reality is not reality. When Saul with letters in his hand, letters of persecution, let this settle into your mind now, Persecution in the name of Jesus. Persecution in the name of God. Absolutely zealous and passionate, believing it with every ounce of his being. Believing, certainly believing. He's not a hypocrite. Believing with every ounce of his being that he's running one of God's errands. When he is arrested from that errand, he hears the same repetition, that Lucan mosaic marker, Saul, Saul, what on earth are you doing? You see, friends, sometimes God just needs to say, David. 
And sometimes, sometimes, God needs to say, David, David. You can be certain that this is the point that Luke is making because look at what happens next in the text. Look at Acts 9, verse 10. The scene changes. If this was a film, it would cut away from the Damascus Road experience to this second scene now, right? The director would say, action! Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named, what's his name, everyone? Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. Not Ananias, Ananias. No. Just Ananias. And you can be sure that this is the point that Luke is making and that Jesus is making because he does not say, Who are you, Lord? What he says is, Here I am, Lord. Now, I don't know what Jesus needs to say to you tonight, but he needs to say your name. What I want to know is, does he need to say it twice? Jesus is going to say your name tonight. It's going to happen. He's going to say your name. By the Spirit, he's going to call your name tonight. And it's either going to be the call of tenderness. It's always the call of tenderness. But it's either going to be the expectant call of tenderness in the context of obedience, in the context of love, in the context of connection, in the context of the gospel, and he's going to say tonight, David, none. He's going to say your name tonight. And, and tonight, you can respond in an act of praise, in an act of worship, in an act of, of gospel connection. You can respond to Jesus tonight as Ananias did, and you can say, here I am, Lord. By your grace, by your grace, here I am, Lord. Here I am. What can I do? What do you need? What do you need done? And Jesus is going to say, you know, we got a situation over here. i got an errand I need you to run. i got this guy over here. You're going to respond. That could happen tonight. That could happen tonight. It could happen tonight that God calls your name by the Spirit, and your response is the response that communicates that you've heard that before. You've heard your name before. You know what to say when you hear your name. You say, here I am, Lord. This was not unique. This was not unheard of for Ananias. He'd heard that before. With a raising of hands, how many of us have heard God call our name through the Spirit, through a friend, through the gospel, through Scripture? Raise your hand. Come on, through worship. You've heard it. And the appropriate response, the gospel response the response of obedience, the response of love, the response of community, the response of faith is, here I am, Lord. But there are times when David... Won't do. There are times when God has to speak into my experience. And it is more regularly than I would probably care to admit in a public setting. There are times that God has to say to me, David, David, you misread that situation. You overreacted in that situation. You lied in that situation. You gossiped in that situation. You lusted in that situation. You were dishonest in that situation. You see, friends, when when Jesus calls my name and he says, David, ah, there's a joy in that. We all know that. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, you know the joy when you're living right, you're walking right, you're praying right, you're reading right, you're just, it just, it's just all right. And, and when some opportunity comes, some invitation, some, some gospel opportunity comes and you hear it, and you just hear David, and you're just like, here I am, Lord, what, what are we doing? What are we? You can move mountains. You feel that you can move mountains. You've got winds under your belt. It, we know that joy and, oh, there's just... There's just the wind under the wings to feel that you're a part of something bigger than yourself. Can the church say amen? When you, when you were a part of helping and not hurting, when you were a part of assisting, when you were a part of some bigger thing that God was doing and, and in a situation you rose to the occasion and, and maybe you had a week or even a month or maybe you had a period in your life where you just felt that you were going from strength to strength, glory to glory, win to win, and, 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 and when the name came when, when, when the invitation came when the call came David you're just like here I am Lord what is it today and then there are those seasons where those seasons situations that I was just describing feel like they are a million miles away they feel like they were not just yesterday, they were like last year. Or maybe they were when you were a child. And there's a sweetness that's gone, a simplicity that's gone, even, dare I say, a naivety that's gone. And I don't think it's coincidental that in every one of these cases, listen carefully, in every one of these cases, religious zeal was masking something. Saul, Saul. Religion is masking relationship. Because remember, when it's Lord, Lord, the question is, uh, do I know you? Do we? Are, are we affiliated? You and I? Because I haven't heard that voice in a long time. I having trouble placing that voice. Simon, Simon, that's religious zeal. Oh, no, 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 no. Though all men deny you, not me. And Jesus is like, that zeal is not going to cut it. That show of religion, that zeal that is not according to knowledge, that's not going to cut it. I need to know you. Martha, Martha, that's clearly religious zeal. Right. Hey, I need help here. What's going on? I need, she's lit. I need, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It's religious. In, in each case, there's, it's a fascinating point here. Abraham is about ready to commit a tremendous act, apparently, of religious devotion. In case after case, it seems, it seems, I, I think we could safely say that it looks like, it, it sure looks like religion is a really good place to hide from God. It, it kind of looks like we can surround ourselves with the language of religion and the culture of religion and the accoutrements of religion and not know God. And it sounds like sometimes we will mask our lack of connection with God by getting super zealous, super judgmental, super conservative. And yet, in this really weird way, this zeal is actually a place to hide from the thing that we need the most, yet frankly fear. And that is a real relationship with God. So I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're in one of these seasons. Or I don't know if you're in one of these seasons. But I am certain that tonight God needs to say your name. God needs to say your name. And tonight he might say your name and you might just say it once. He might just say, Cindy. And you say, here I am, Lord. It's been a good week. It's been a good semester. Broke up with that guy. <laughs> He's gone. Temptations. Whew! Here I am, Lord. What do you need? You need someone to help out in the local church? Here I am, Lord. Does a classmate need tutoring? Here I am, Lord. 
Does a friend need me to watch their children every Wednesday night while they go to night school? Here I am, Lord, what do you need? There's not a doubt in my mind that there are people here tonight that need to hear their name. And they need to respond with that, here I am, Lord. But I also imagine that there would be a percentage of us, perhaps even a majority of us, a significant percentage of us that need to hear not David, not Cindy, not Josephine, not Johnny, not Andrew. We need to hear David, David. Josephine, Josephine. Johnny, Johnny. Andrew, Andrew. I don't know, but you do, and the Spirit does. So in this moment right here, I want you to just sort of take a moment, survey, not just your emotional landscape, though that's, that's not unimportant, that is important, but I want you to just sort of survey Survey your bank account. What's the spirit saying there? Is is the spirit saying Cindy or is the spirit saying Cindy Cindy? I want you to survey that holy of holies, that, that sacred of sacreds, that place that, that, that is the, the secret place, the place that is uniquely and exclusively and singularly ours, your phone. Man, these phones are great. They are litmus tests into what really mattered to us. I love it. That phone is not a phone, it's a portal into worlds. We go, where do we go? I don't want you to just survey your emotional landscape tonight because you may be moved or unmoved. You might have eaten too much food and you've had trouble paying attention and so you're unmoved. You might be in an emotional state right now, and so you're deeply moved. I hope you're deeply moved, but I'm not banking on that. I want you to think about your phone. In the light of that, what does Jesus need to say to you tonight? Is that, is that Cindy? To which you respond, here I am, Lord. You know me, you know my texting, you know my Instagram, you know my web history, you, you know my Snapchat, you know my filters, you know my texts. Here I am, Lord, here I am. Or, or, tonight, do you need to hear Cindy, Cindy? How about this one? I want you to survey your health. You're 18 to 25. You feel invincible. You can eat what you want to eat. You can live how you want to live. You can sleep when you... You don't have to sleep. You feel great. Let me tell you something. It's going to catch up to you. It's going to catch up to you. You hear what I'm saying? It's going to catch up to you. I want to tell you a story. Right now at this age... You are laying the groundwork for the habits that will define the rest of your life right now. In these collegiate years, you are establishing habits, health habits, sleep habits, dietary habits, social habits. You are establishing habits right now that will become, perhaps, very likely, the defining habits for the rest of your life. And I just want to ask you, I just want to ask you, are you taking care of yourself? You know, that body that you've got is amazing. Did you know that? 
Did you know you have an amazing body? And I'm not talking like Instagram amazing. <laughs> I'm talking like physiologically, neurologically, biochemically, anatomically, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I want to tell you something else. That body, that body you got, that don't belong to you. That belongs to Jesus. That's not your body. You're on, that's on loan. So I want to ask you, are you taking care of that body? Friends, tonight, the last thing I want to ask you is, how is your spirit? The other day, I did something really weird. I, um, I was in Rome, and um, we went to this place called the Scala Santa, Santa, which is this Rome, uh, Pilate staircase. It's like the, the staircase that, that goes up, that, that Luther, in 1510, was going up on his knees. And I was there with our tour group, and uh, there was a whole bunch of Catholic pilgrims there, and they were going up on their knees, and I started thinking about, man, Luther went up on these very stairs on his knees, and he had an amazing experience. And I'm not going to do it for Catholic reasons, but you know what? I'm going to go up those stairs on my knees, and I'm going to pray on every step that God will teach me what it means that the just shall live by faith. So I did it. It's a really non-Protestant thing to do. <laughs> so I get on the stairs next to a nun and a priest, and I'm surrounded by all these Catholic pilgrims, and I'm just like praying in the name of Jesus, teach me what the great truth of righteousness by faith. I mean, I wasn't praying out loud. I was praying in my own mind, but I'm going up. And as I was going up, I was like, man, my knees hurt. And then it dawned on me, you know, that's because you don't spend very much time on them. And suddenly I started to feel like a Catholic. I was like, man, I'm going to stay on these stairs forever until my knees harden up. Uh, you don't have to get on your knees to pray, but do you? What about this thing? What about this thing? Remember this thing? This Bible? How important is this? Not at all? Somewhat? Moderately? Extremely? Very? I don't know the answer. But I know my answer. And there are seasons in my life when I say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. And there are seasons, even in the pastor's life, where I say, have to hear, David, David. David, David. So here's the appeal. The appeal's already made, and frankly, I believe that you've already responded to the appeal in the way that matters most, and that's in your heart. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Let's talk to the Lord. Father in heaven, we have never gone to the high priest and asked for letters. We have never thought to imprison people who didn't practice religion exactly like we do. But Father, we have used a condemnatory and judgmental zeal to mask our own religious frailty. Father, at the end of the day, we get the strong impression that you are not going to ask us how religious were you. We see it right there in the Gospels. People are going to say to you, but Lord, we prophesied in your name, and in your name we did all this really cool religious stuff. And then the question comes back, the question comes back, the haunting, inviting, plaintive question comes back, who are you? Father, tonight, these are not words of threat, these are words of tenderness, these are words of heartbreak. We gather here tonight as a group of mostly 18 to 25-year-olds, and Father, we live 
in the most sensual, stimulating culture and world and society that has ever existed. And nothing like this, Lord. And if ever there was a time when your saints needed you, that time is right now. If ever there was a time when we needed a connection, that time is right now. So, Father, tonight, I'm asking you to speak everybody's name. And, Father, only you know, and only the individual knows if they're going to hear David or if tonight they need to hear David, David. You're in the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality. Father, help us to look honestly at our bank account. Help us to look honestly at our phone. Help us to look honestly at our social media. Help us to look honestly at our health. Help us to look honestly at our prayer life. Help us to look honestly at the Bible. Father, you tonight are speaking to hearts. And the invitation is there. Tonight we respond by the Spirit. Father, are we on a mountaintop? Are we responding tonight with joyful enthusiasm, with positivity and excitement about what tomorrow holds, the ministry and service opportunities that are in front of us, fired up for the gospel, fired up to share the truth of Jesus with a world in need? Father, if that's us tonight, we say, here are we, Lord. But Father, tonight... Maybe we need to hear David, David, Josephine, Josephine, Mark, Mark, Johnny, Johnny, Cindy, Cindy. And Father, help us not to believe for a moment that this is anything other than an opportunity for an awakening, for the light to come on, to have a Damascus Road experience of our own right here at Compass to reevaluate and to reorient and to recalibrate ourselves around the things that matter most. Father, forgive us where we have, in some cases, used religion to mask a real connection. I wonder by a raising of hands with Heads bowed and eyes closed. How many tonight want to say with me, tonight I, I need to hear David, David, Cindy, Cindy, Mark, Mark, Becky, Becky. Raise your hand high tonight. The Spirit's speaking to your heart. I'm seeing those hands go up. My hands are up. Father, tonight is a beautiful night. It's a sobering night. It's a night that we've needed to hear Saul, Saul, Simon, Simon. Moses, Moses, Abraham, Abraham, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And tonight we're asking you to speak hope, speak grace, speak healing, speak restoration, speak forgiveness into our lives. This is our prayer tonight. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen.